Hey there, and welcome to Cosmologies. Join us as we explore the intersections of science, spirit, and the human experience. Are you curious? Let's go. From the mysteries within us to the majesty without, Cosmology, that's what it's all about. Hello everyone and welcome to Cosmologies a place where we explore science, storytelling, spirituality, the human experience, and more. So if you've been with this podcast for most of the season, you may have noticed that we've been tying every episode back to some kind of seasonal or astronomical phenomena occurring at that time. This is, of course, very intentional because I really love planning an adventure and I love astronomy just about as much. But this month, we're going in a bit of a different direction by diving into the nexus of art, mysticism, and neuroscience with Dr. Siddharth Ramakrishnan. I was first introduced to Dr. Ramakrishnan's work at a salon for the union of art and science at a local university. I don't really remember how I wound up there, but it was one of those curious times when the social media algorithm recommends just the right niche thing. In this case, Neurotarot. I was intrigued enough to show up with three nerdy philosophical friends to participate in Dr. Siddharth's interactive salon all about neuroscience and the oracle card phenomenon known as tarot. I'll speak a bit more about this evening in a bit, but first I want to provide a brief introduction to the tarot. Full disclosure, Unlike the astronomy topics in previous episodes, I am not an art historian or a tarot professional, so the knowledge I'm sharing right now might be a bit cursory, especially if you work with the tarot often. Still, I hope to give you a bit of background and history, and I'll drop some links to some places to explore more in the episode description. And if you're ever like, oh my god, Natalie, I know this... (laughs) feel free to skip ahead to the interview. So chances are that you've run into tarot cards at some point in your life, if not in your own experience, then perhaps on TV. On its most basic level, the term tarot generally refers to a deck of cards that contains 78 cards in five different suits. The four main suits can differ depending on the deck, but generally tend towards the suits of cups, swords, wands, and coins. Each of these four suits contains numbered cards 1 through 10, or ace through 10, also called pip cards, and four face cards, usually with some order of rank such as page, knight, queen, and king. The final suit contains all trump cards, which are also numbered 1 through 21, with an extra card sometimes labeled 0. Each of these trump cards generally has another title as well, with the zero card often being called the fool. There are many tarot historians out there doing good research about the origins of these cards, and there are also a lot of people throughout history making absolutely wild speculations. So there are many potential origin stories for many versions of these cards. But one thing we know for sure is that the tarot started off as a card game. Many scholars credit the invention of playing cards to China, probably from the Song Dynasty in the 1100s, and based off of even earlier dice games. The word pi may refer to tiles, such as those used in mahjong or dominoes, but may also refer to paper cards printed with wood blocks. And by the 1200s, there are definite records of these games being played, as well as some of their stakes. We also see the invention of the idea of suits, sometimes representing different forms of currency or civil and military suits. And thus, we find trick-taking games, banking games, fishing games, and more. And a lot of these games and decks still exist in some form today. By this time, the Silk Road, which is not really one road, but a vast network of land paths throughout the Asian continent, had already been passing goods and ideas for well over a millennia, so the concept spread. 
and specifically it spread to the Islamic world, where it manifested as a style of card deck called the Mamluk deck, after the dominant empire of the time. This is usually identified as the major precursor to tarot today. There were four suits, numbered 1 through 10, with three court cards, and these suits were curved scimitars, polo sticks, cups, and coins. And because of Islamic religious traditions, the three court cards, king, viceroy, and second viceroy, were indicated with words, not images. Some surviving cards are delicately hand-painted and probably belonged to extremely wealthy individuals, and almost all have ornate geometric designs. Some other cards bear calligraphic inscriptions of aphorisms, similar to an idiom or a fortune. For example, with the sword of happiness, I shall redeem a beloved who will afterwards take my life. Or, O oh, thou who hast possessions, remain happy, and thou shalt have a pleasant life. The Mamluk dynasty and their cards and card games made their way into the ports of Spain and Italy, where they spread rapidly throughout Europe. And soon there were spin-off cards that straightened the scimitars into swords, kept cups and coins, and ambiguated polo sticks into batons, clubs, wands, and other similar items. Court cards were also given elaborate pictures to depict a king, queen, knight, and page. Card playing became extremely popular, and like new extremely popular things, was often banned, which of course made it even more popular. And eventually, trick-taking games such as the predecessor to Bridge, where one suit is deemed a trump suit or a triumph suit, became so popular that someone had the bright idea of just making an entire triumph suit for a game called Triomphi. From here, there's a lot more written records about which Italian dukes are commissioning decks and what some of the Triumphi cards may have been, from Greek gods to allegories, flowers, or even hunting scenes. And Renaissance Italy was full of creative new interpretations. There's even a version of the game where these cards are assigned to players and used to create an impromptu piece of poetry, like a whose line is it anyway spoken word parlor game. Still, if you've ever played much with a deck of cards, you'll know that they're hard to hold onto and keep nice, unless they're too nice to ever be used, so there are very few intact decks. But there are enough to suggest that it's around this time that they start to take on a form extremely similar to the tarot we know today, and that the triumph cards that we know, such as the star, the devil, the emperor, and more, begin to get somewhat codified. As the games spread throughout Europe, many other variants came into play. The game played with triumph suits became known as Tarochi, to distinguish it from triumph games with only four suits. Some decks dropped the triumphs and took on the well-known hearts, clubs, diamonds, and spades. And the churches continued to try to ban gambling, gaming, and cards with the devil on them. Now you may be asking, when does the fortune telling come into play? And that's a really difficult question to answer, because cards come from dice games, and people have been using dice in divination for as far back as we can tell. So it stands to reason that cards have probably been used similarly in folk practices for as long. But things get a distinctly occult spin in late 1700s France. It's the time of mesmerism, spiritualism, Saint Germain, Cagliostro, alchemy, the Rosicrucians, a Kabbalah revival, and more. And this guy named Antoine Court de Jabalon, he wrote an essay on tarot and a book all about his theories on the ancient world. He tied each of the triumph cards to a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and also claimed that the cards might be a form in which the Book of Thoth may have survived from ancient Egypt. And if this is sounding familiar, it's because we talked about Thoth as an Egyptian god of writing, knowledge, and more in the Mercury episode earlier this season. 
And because this was a time very much like today where people could just say things and everybody else would say, oh, that checks out, this idea spread into the fraternal societies. Now steeped in new lore, the Triumph cards became known as the Major Arcana, meaning mysteries, and the Pips as the Minor Arcana. And this, of course, led to all new occult decks tables and correspondences with astrology, Kabbalah, and angels for using the cards in ritual, books on interpretation and divination, and more. We could honestly do a whole episode on those, but it's important to know that one of those societies was the Order of the Golden Dawn, a ceremonial magic group highly influential to modern-day orders and magical groups. Really, we could do a whole mini-series on this, but a lot of other folks are already doing a great job of that on their podcasts. But it is important to the story because the most well-known tarot deck today, sometimes known as the Rider Waite Coleman Smith deck, Rider Waite deck, or Waite Smith deck, was designed by two Golden Dawn members. It's said that in the early 1900s, Arthur Waite designed the deck and commissioned theatrical scenic painter Pamela Coleman Smith to illustrate it. But a lot of tarot scholars today are pretty sure that it was the artist, Smith, who did most of the legwork, which she, of course, never saw a penny for. Go figure. The deck was originally known as the Rider Waite because Rider was the publisher, but folks have been trying to correct it by adding Smith's name back on it. Anyway, Smith painted elaborate scenes, gestures, and tableaus on every card, including the Minor Arcana, which previously had mostly just been pictures of numbers of objects. The elaborate language of symbolism on each card, minor and major, not only depicts the number of each type of object in each card, but also tells a different story in every suit. Some folks say that the Minor Arcana are based off of mythological or historical stories, but the story of the Major Arcana can sometimes be read as a journey through the major transitions of life. Anyway, if we fast forward a bit and cut out a lot more interesting art and occult history, tarot is experiencing a strong revival today. There are thousands of decks that draw inspiration from the Waitsmith deck and its many predecessors, due in large part to the internet, self-publishing, and the rise of magical traditions to the mainstream. We're almost done, but there are two more quick things that we should touch on. First, I want to follow up on that whole ancient Egypt chestnut. There are a lot of reasons why people might want to cite the cards back to Egypt, and one of them is kind of valid, and that's that the Mamluk dynasty that brought playing cards into the West did expand into the region of Africa that is Egypt, so the cards very well might have been there in the 1300s. The Mamluk deck may have even been conceived there, we don't really know. But we can definitely say that this just pre-Renaissance period is not ancient. Another thing, the ancient Egyptians did use papyrus, but they used it in scrolls, and as far as we know, didn't really have cards. Again, we're pretty sure that came from China. Still, Antoine Court de Jabalon's theory was that the Book of Thoth, a book supposedly written by the god Thoth himself about various arts and mysteries, was written at some point, lost at another, and somehow preserved in a more subtle form, the symbolism of these cards. This episode isn't really about the Book of Thoth, and we don't have time to dive very deeply into the various texts that have been said to be a part of this, but if you interpret this non-literally as the idea that all humans will use languages of archetypes and symbology to interpret their world, then you could maybe make it work. It's a fun idea, but not one that holds up to historical analysis of where the cards actually come from. Finally, there's a third Egypt origin story that's actually just rooted in racism and the tired trope of the Romani fortune teller. This is the idea that the Romani people supposedly brought the card out of Egypt and into Europe, which doesn't work at all, because the Romani people weren't from Egypt, and also they didn't. 
the timelines just don't match up. This is another idea perpetuated by Jabalant and also all of society. There's actually a lively discussion on the internet about whether charging for fortunes in tarot readings and profiting off of the sale of tarot decks is cultural misappropriation and whether tarot reading is a closed practice. Here's the thing. Romani racism still exists today, and throughout history, Romani people have been taken as slaves, made into indentured servants, made to undergo forced sterilization, chased out of town, and murdered, often legally. Some will argue that if this is happening to you, it sure makes it awful hard to get a job, and that one way people could go into business for themselves is fortune-telling. Churches really wanted to shut this down, but there was a market for it that most citizens wouldn't dare fill, so folks on the margins of society could scrape by on this work. This creates a feedback cycle leading to more discrimination and persecution, so some folks argue that even though the Romani had nothing to do with tarot creation, their history with this stigma gives them the right to control it. Now, others say that this is just another example of treating Romani as magical outsiders and is a continuation of an incredibly offensive stereotype, as Romani people do not share a common belief system and don't culturally own tarot or divination. Some split it down the middle and say that it's fine to profit off of fortune telling if you're part of a marginalized group. It's also worth noting that oracle cards, or other cards that are used for cardomancy that don't follow the format of tarot, are seen by some folks as okay, and others as more of the same issue. As with most things, this comes down to individual opinion because no culture is a monolith. But it's worth noting this as something you might run into if you plan on working more with the tarot. The final thing I wanted to wrap up with is that there is a third main use for these cards, other than games and divination. Something that is a bit of both, and that is the use of these cards for introspection and meditation. I happen to fall into this camp, so I'll speak about it a little more personally. I regard oracle cards not as tools of telling the future, but as tools of self-knowledge. I like that if I'm meditating on a topic, the history and artwork of a card, drawn at random, can open me up to possibilities in a situation that I have not yet explored. There are many humans of psychological, artistic, and spiritual bent such as Carl Jung, Joseph Campbell, Mary Kay Greer, and many more who have interpreted the structure, archetypes, and symbology of these cards in really fun, brilliant ways and walking through them feels like putting my brain through a jungle gym. And that's part of why I've asked today's guest to be here with us. Dr. Ramakrishnan has found a way to teach us even more about ourselves by taking us beyond the symbolism in our heads and inside the actual physical makeup of our own brains. I'm going to let him explain that for us himself here. So without further ado, Siddharth Ramakrishnan, PhD, is a neuroscientist and educator with over 20 years of experience. His work explores the developing brains of animals and how brain hormones are influenced by the environment. With a PhD from the University of Illinois and postdoctoral research from UCLA and Columbia University, he serves as the chair in neuroscience at the University of Puget Sound and is currently the Director of Research at BMCC SUNY. You can check out the link in our episode description to see some of his science work. A fellow at the UCLA Art Sci Center, his collaborations with artists have led to exhibitions and documentaries that blend the works of art and science, highlighting topics such as hox genes, animal umwelts, and biomimicry. An artist himself, he recently created the Neuro Tarot deck inspired by the major arcana of tarot, but infused with neuroscience concepts. More information can be found at brainmystic.com, which we will also put in the episode description. There you can also find information about his new course for visionaries and diviners on how the brain moves from vision to intuition to insight. 
Hi, Siddharth. It's so fantastic to have you here on our show, Cosmologies. Um, something that I really love about your work so far is that you seem really passionate about uniting art and science and about uh, sharing science with the world. <laughs> so um, I I sometimes think it's not my my trust my my mom is an artist and my dad is a surgeon so i always thought my dna is kind of like controlling this whole collaboration maybe <laughs> but uh, i used to paint a lot when i was an undergrad um and then um through grad school during my phd i did not do much of um art even though i wrote a lot and then I don't know if you experience it, but as a scientist, you sometimes feel very selfish because you are um, happy if your experiments work and you're unhappy if experiments don't work. <laughs> and there's no connection with people sometimes. And I was this postdoc at UCLA and I was really unhappy because I was stuck in a basement doing my experiments and feeling very selfish. And... At that point, I met a nanoscientist, Jim Gimzowski, and told him I want to work with him. And he said, no, 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 you should work with my partner, who was an artist. And he introduced me to my uh, friend and collaborator, Victoria Vesna, about 10 years ago now. And then, um, so she introduced me to this world of art and science where you could kind of mingle both together. Mm. And initially I was more of a science consultant and then slowly we became more equal partners and collaborators. And at some point I was uh, kind of hosting exhibitions on my own uh, because she was, she was, she couldn't be around. So making those art decisions. So <laughs> I guess it's a slow glacial move from being, calling myself a neuroscientist and now I can happily say neuroscientist and artist or sci artist. So I'm very uh, happy with that medium actually. So. Oh, fantastic. Sci artist. I will start using that. I think <laughs> a sci artist. Um, so speaking of neuroscience, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you got into that line of work? Yeah, so in India, you have to decide your future at 16. And um, so I, even though I was interested in biology, I was asked to choose computer science, uh, even though I really wanted to go into fashion school. <laughs> 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 but I was asked to choose uh, computer science for my undergrad. And so I came to the US with uh, the goal of diversifying that computer science degree and um, I told myself every year when I'm doing my master's in computer science, I'm going to take two biology classes. And uh, so I was doing artificial intelligence in computers. And uh, at each semester, I used to take like a bio class just to satisfy my hunger. And one of those courses was a course on neuroethology, which is the study of animals in the wild and looking at their behavior. And then coming back into the classroom and understanding what the brain circuits are behind that behavior. Mm. And so that's what the neuroethology is. And I was so hooked. I was like, this is it. I, I cannot do computers anymore. I have to do biology. And then so that's why I shifted into a, a PhD in neuroscience. And I was fascinated with animal behavior and animal brains and um, started working on snails and cockroaches uh, at my PhD level. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's kind of how I do dove into the, co the field of neuroscience. I was really passionate about it. I was not one of those people who was looking at creatures when I was young. Uh, it all kind of hit me much later in life, I think. So I feel that especially in the world of ecology. It's like once you <laughs> finally are able to pursue something that you really love, when you're an adult, there's nothing in your way from pursuing what you really love. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, can you share with us maybe a fun uh, neural ecology fact? So it's neuroethology, not oh, ecology. Etho yeah, ethology. Ethology. Um, so e E-T-H-O-L-O-G-Y, ethology, neuroethology. Oh. And... Um, yeah, so, uh, for example, snails, uh, which I did my PhD on, um, they have these amazing um, pattern generators. So, 
when when you walk or when you run you don't think about it it just is a program that happens so you move left right left right and then if you do it faster it'll be running and then you then you can modulate those same muscles to climb up stairs or swim so you're using the same legs and arms but you're using it differently based on what kind of motion you want to do mm-hmm. and all these are controlled by these um neural centers called central pattern generators so there are patterns that move you in this rhythmic manner and there's many of these so when you breathe you breathe in and breathe out and you don't think about it or uh, when you swallow or chew food you don't really think about it it just happens so to study these in um detail it's easier to study in simple organisms called like snails and snails have this amazing pattern generator that controls their um uh their oral movements so everything that they eat um that the, they have this almost like an ice cream scoop like thing that will scrape food and then swallow it so when you eat ice cream you you put out your tongue lick the ice cream and then swallow it so snails do exactly that for scraping food off any surface um but the nice part is based on the environment it changes the pattern so if you put if you give a snail watermelon juice it will do the scoop action where it'll put the scoop out it'll uh scrape the watermelon or the watermelon juice and it'll put it back in <laughs> but if you give the snail something that it doesn't like like listerine or like other like random stuff that it doesn't like it'll start throwing up and so it'll change its behavioral pattern based on uh what kind of inputs it receives and um and then so i was studying how this this movement is changed when snails are laying eggs and they also use their mouth <laughs> to <laughs> uh, to stick eggs on like le- on surfaces so they actually make these tiny grooves and then they stick their eggs on it so um <laughs> they use their mouths so i was trying trying to see how that behavioral pattern changes so yeah it's a fun thing of studying the behavior and then going back to the brain and saying okay what's going on what's I mean why is it doing it in this environment kind of thing so yeah absolutely one of the, those unanswered questions you're answering them <laughs> awesome is there for you any spiritual connection to the tarot or anything like that and would you like to talk about it So I grew up Hindu um and I still consider myself uh, a Hindu and I have like an altar at home and I pray every morning um but I also went to a a school in India which uh did not believe in idol worship so there was a tension in my house where my parents had like a an altar and they would practice idol worship but as we my brother and I went to a school which was against it um and so we it was more of a a spiritual learning um which we were imparted at school um and so that was kind of um how uh, so meditation and yoga were all part of the schooling system almost and um but then i never like encountered things like tarot or or something like that but astrology was a uh, a prominent um focus um not at home per se because my uh, dad being a surgeon it was not really uh something that we uh delved into mm-hmm. uh but my mom used to sometimes um you know ask astrologers for questions or something like that so it was more of a every once in a while you'll just dabble in it um but it wasn't something we practiced it was more you call an astrologer or you consult with someone so um so when i came to the us uh, my sister who was already living in philadelphia she gave me my first set of tarot cards um and um so we should just practice readings on each other and for me as a it is more of a meditative practice where i'm able to uh look at it and uh kind of clear my mind a little bit um and also set some intentions based on it mm-hmm. and um especially um around 20 even before the pandemic even before isolation began uh i went through a period where i felt really isolated and i was living um alone and i used to take a card of tarot every day and um 
set my intentions based on it and draw the first thing that came to my head. So it became a very meditative practice, which um, helped me focus a little bit um, instead of just, I guess, going through the day without any intention. It really focused it a little bit. Yeah, I I feel that. I've definitely incorporated things like that into my life as well. <laughs> and and not always from the point of view of like, oh yeah, this is definitely, you know, this is maybe not something that actually tells the future or something, but something that helps me get right with where I am in my brain. Um, before we delve into the neuro tarot that you've developed, I'm wondering if you have any neuroscience insights as to um, what's going on in our head when we make those kinds of uh, observations and set those kinds of intentions and incorporate them into our lives and really start acting on them. That's a really great question. And um, that's something I've been doing a lot of research for in terms of developing these um, neuro tarot deck. And uh, to learn more, you can <laughs> join my <laughs> class, which is coming up, um, probably um, going to be released soon on my website at www.brainmystic.com. And the class is about um, trying to understand um, what is the process that your brain undergoes when it is using different kinds of divination tools. Let's say you have a tarot card or an oracle card or an astrology chart, um, you are seeing a, a visual image. So we first talk about what happens to the visual image and how does it get processed in the brain. And then we talk about what is the concept of mental imagery. So when you see something, it's a it's an image, but it goes beyond that. There is, a, even when you close your eyes, you're able to picture certain things and it might be completely different than what you saw in front of your eyes. And so how, where do the circuits for these kinds of mental imagery lie? And then we then say, okay, if you say, if I say a table, you don't just evoke the image of a table. You might evoke the image of, say, a dinner or a, a flower vase or a tablecloth. So there are mm. associate images and associate meanings with those with that particular image. So we then delve into that kind of associate imagery. Um, and then my research led me down into this path of what is intuition, right? So this kind of concept of an image is one thing, but a lot of divination or even things like surgeons or um, chess players need to go beyond that picture and then say, okay, what's the next move? Where should I cut next? And there's an intuitive leap, almost like a faithful leap that you take, knowing that this is what the right step is going to be. And there is this intuition is really interesting because there is uh if you ask in that moment why you did it you will not know it's almost like an unconscious leap mm -hmm. maybe later you might get insight into it because you think oh you know i saw this this and this and all that led to that conclusion of this insight like aha okay that's why i did it but insight comes later and there are all these brain circuits which talk about intuition and insight and what is connected to what and so it's been really a great pleasure, like researching about it. And I'm really excited to bring that to like, you know, break it down and make it really simple so that everybody can understand those concepts. Yeah, That is really fascinating. <laughs> I really love exploring those liminal spaces between thought and not thought. It's, it's never what I think, you know, intu intuitively based off of my experience, it never functions the way that I expect it to inside the brain yeah and um they all it's it it kind of led me into this other path of um you talk about gut feeling and knowing that something is right or you know this is the way it is supposed to be and uh where does that actually arise from like you know, what is this interoception is what it's called which is this inner sense so they actually say you can when people are asked can you tell us how fast your heart is beating? Most people can accurately say how fast your heart is beating. Whoa. And, and then if you practice and practice and practice, you can actually get really, really good at it. And then, yeah. 
And then that can then be used to kind of understand your emotions and to understand your gut feelings and, you know, making the choices and things like that. Wow. <laughs> That's wild. <laughs> Oh man, that reminds me of that that thing where you can train yourself to know like what time it is, even though time is not real. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, well, fantastic. That leads me into my next question. We've talked a little bit about it, um, but what is what is neuro tarot? Yeah, so neuro tarot evolved where um, I was looking at tarot cards and um, I was thinking. Well, these are cards which are um, essentially talking about your emotions. They're talking about behavior. They're talking about choices. And it is all connected to the brain and behavior. So anything about these kinds of actions or introspection that you're doing is all connected with neural processes. So I was thinking, well, if this is the case, then... um, I would like to know if um, I can kind of redesign these cards and talk about neuroscience concepts, uh, which are um, kind of inspired by these themes of the major arcana and uh, these themes of these tarot cards. And so I started doing some research and um, there's an amazing library in uh, in Seattle called the Seattle Metaphysical Library. Uh, It's a very hard library to find. Um, but I yes, was, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I was at a coffee shop in Ballard the other day, and one on like a couple of years ago, and um, I was just wandering around, and I saw this like little board outside which said Metaphysical Library, and I was like, "Where is this place?" And then I had to go down into the basement, and I found this like whole treasure trove, and there I found all these books on tarot, and the fascinating part was most of the books talking about the psychology or the symbolism behind the tarot were written by biologists and psychologists with PhDs. And um, so I was like, okay, I'm not that kooky. So people have actually thought about these things before. So (laughs) I started doing a lot more research into it. And then um, uh, it was a fun exercise for me. And it's because as I was telling you, I've been trying to blend the art and the science together it was a great way for me to get back into painting and get back Mm. into actually drawing things because each of these tarot images was so vivid that it used to then I was then thinking okay what is this what is this neuroscience aspect of this so what do I want to convey and then I would then um, initially I was thinking I'll ask someone else to draw it but then I was thinking, well, there's no one else who has the, the neuroscience background and is interested in this. So I just said, OK, let me try it. And it really um, helped me uh, go back to my roots of painting and drawing and sketching things. So. That's lovely. Yeah. Trust your your hands. <laughs> yeah. So can you maybe walk us through your process for creating a few of these cards or can you give us an example of what? what would you be found on a neuro tarot card yeah so the tarot cards um especially the major arcana um have very um uh, specific uh words and uh themes associated with them uh for example the 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 second card in the major arcana is called the magician card uh which is this magician with a wand raised and it's all about um when when someone gets the card it's supposed to be about taking action and like moving forward and um and that you have the agency to do something and uh, for me the word action immediately uh was thinking in order for us to move or in order for anything to happen, your neuron needs to fire what is called as an action potential. So the neuron has to send the signal and only then will you then have the activity or the agency to do anything. So all the the themes around the word of the magician or the magician card uh, to me signified what was called the action potential. So that was, I didn't decide, okay, this is what, this card is going to be and then I am um, so on a blank canvas then I was then thinking okay what is this going to look like and for me an action potential is um, 
almost once it starts, it's called a cascade of, of movement. So once it starts, it can't be stopped. So it almost looked like a tsunami wave. So once the wave starts, it can't be stopped. So the, the, um, the drawing kind of evoked this tsunami going down a neuron and which is kind of how the neural signal is transmitted. So mm. um, I didn't want it to be just scientific illustrations. I still wanted to have some kind of a, uh, like when you look at it, it'll still evoke some emotion in, in people. So that's kind of how that, um, that particular card went. Um, another card, uh, for example, is um, the, uh, it's called the impulse card and that one was um uh, was inspired by the devil card of the of the tarot deck and so the devil is about um you know loss of hedonistic impulses and loss of uh you know doing impulse making impulsive decisions and um losing control almost and uh for me this was a really fun card to draw because um uh, when I'm thinking of impulse control, then there's a part of the brain that controls your impulsive actions. It's called the basal ganglia. And in fact, a lot of people with Parkinson's disease, um, they start having deterioration of the basal ganglia. And uh, in fact, sometimes um, uh, Parkinson's treatment causes them to lose control, lose impulse control, and they become gamblers or uh, some of them watch like child pornography. You know, it just becomes uh, where you lose that impulse control, which is always there in you. So um, I started sketching this uh, this area of the brain and uh, almost as if it's a puppet master controlling the, the, the man who's a puppet. And interestingly enough, the, the, if you, as I was drawing it, it almost looked like something with horns and, you know, and like the, like two red eyes and things like that. So some of the imagery <laughs> of the devil came in, uh, even though it had no, you know, uh, direct link that way. So, it, so that's another example of something I drew. Yeah. Now, traditionally the devil card oh never mind i'm thinking of a different card for a second i started thinking about the death card <laughs> but that's a different card yeah the death card um uh the death card was um i uh, it's like the end of cycles and the beginning of new cycles so it's not always yeah. like a bad card to get so right uh, for me that was uh something like neural degeneration so where the neurons are getting destroyed after say um an injury but on face value, again, you will think, oh, it's bad, right? But actually not because um, before a neuron, when a neuron gets injured, not only is it getting, um, uh, it, is it getting uh, kind of um, degenerated, but the cells are actually recycling all the stuff that's being, you know, thrown out. And then it's used to build new things. And only after a neuron, like a damaged neuron is removed, can new growth start. So in a way, even though it looks on face value bad, it's actually the beginning of a new cycle. So it is a very positive thing for me to think about. So I really love that. I think every tarot deck I've ever looked at, when we get to the interpretation of the death card, they say, now, now hold up a minute. The death card is not does not mean that you're going to die. <laughs> and hardly ever does that actually happen. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it's almost always about you know regeneration i love that and that there's you know a thing we can connect that to do you have any plans for doing any of the minor arcana yes <laughs> <laughs> um i've i'm uh i've been really um getting into it now um so for me the minor arcana is going further into neuroscience and i want people to learn all about the neuroscience of animal kingdoms around us yes so um i've divided them into shells um feathers um and then i think there's one going to be on mammals like pelts and one on insects and can i guess what they align with sure <laughs> can i guess okay i'm gonna guess that shells Align with cups. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Feathers with swords. Yeah. Okay. And then mammals, I'm going to guess pentacles. I think so. I don't remember now. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. 
because I also had to match up like some of these um, tarot uh, correspondences also have to do with the elements. So I kind of yes. had to also match those up as well. So I was kind of thinking about which goes where. So I think my conflict was between uh, insects and birds, um, you know, which one goes into the air as opposed to um, uh, fire, fire and air kind of thing was a, was a difference for me. Oh, um, yeah. But I started working on the snails, like the, the, the molluscan ones and all the shells. And it's been really, really fun because you got snails and octopi and all these different things that are like going from uh, all over the place. So it's really been a lot of fun, actually. So Now, a question, a further question on that. Um, a lot of times people in the monarchana will use the numerology to kind of help interpret the card um, or, you know, in the, the writer weight, Pamela Coleman Smith deck, um, you know, there's a story being told throughout uh, in your minor arcana that you're coming up with, with these, all of these different creatures. Um, are you, how are you pairing them to the numbers? Um, the way <laughs> I'm pairing them to the numbers in a very different fashion. So, um, uh, the, uh, like, for example, I've, I've gone through about half of the, the, the cups uh, and the first one is almost like a cornucopia of like, uh, there's this one shell, which is just like overflowing with abundance. And then it's talking for about ace. for the ace of cups. Okay. And then it talks about how a shell is made. Like what is the neuro neurological thing behind the making of a shell? And, and so it kind of goes, goes like that. So it's more about, I think the numbers are signified in how many of these. Um, and then the two of, the two of cups is really amazing because these snails throw, um, I don't know if you know, but they, when they make love to each other, they throw calcium darts at each other. So, uh, <laughs> so calcium is, is something that's excitatory. So the snails have these almost like arrows of calcium that they just throw <laughs> at each other and then they get really excited and they mate. So Amazing. the two of cups is like these two snails like mating <laughs> with like an, uh, like a calcium arrow in between them. So, <laughs> so the numbers are coming through. Um, yeah, <laughs> the spirit of the numbers. <laughs> yes, the spirit of the numbers are coming through, but there, I I don't think there's like a uh, like a true storyline. If that's not yet, anyway, I don't know if it's going to emerge, but that's not, this is not yet. Yeah, and you know, you can the the numbers themselves have their own storyline. So whether it follows it or not, I think is completely irrelevant. I mean, the the cards themselves don't they barely even follow a storyline <laughs> depending on which tradition you're reading from and, and what story you think it lines up with. Um, I've, I've read that there's a couple of, of different like, stories for each suit as to what's going on and they're all hermetic and tied up in secret societies and stuff. So <laughs> who knows? There's more than one way to read a set of cards yeah, is what yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> So I have a bunch more questions, but I'm wondering um, if we can try something weird. Uh, do you have the cards with you? I actually do have a deck here. Yeah, I do have a deck here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there is a podcast that I love called Between the Worlds, um, and every week to deal with whatever card they're talking about they pull another card to kind of help people get through that thing so i'm wondering if maybe we can like pull a card here together of maybe what our uh, something that our listeners can think about and meditate on specifically for this week that they're listening to it of course, you have the cards, so it's all it's all in I'm your shuffling. hands. You tell me when to stop. <laughs> okay. How about now? Okay. So the card I picked was it's called introspection. Ooh. And um, it's about the pineal gland. Um, so this one is all about um, trying to, as you mentioned, meditate and. Um, saying that the answers that you're looking for are almost within. Um, and in the main, in the major arcana of the tarot, it would be the high, high priestess card, almost like a solitary um, uh, lady who is very knowledgeable 
and but then a lot and then a lot of her knowledge also comes from that self awareness of uh, of that deep within and for me that was almost um thinking about the third eye which in a lot of cultures uh which uh, some people say is the pineal gland um which um is fascinatingly in a lot of creatures uh the pineal gland is what is the homing signal for migration so oh, really? irrespective of where you are in the world you'll know where to go because of the pineal gland and wow. for me it's almost like your inner brain telling you you know I mean this is where you're meant to be or this is where you should be going and you actually know it and you just have to like meditate on it and kind of dive a little bit deeper so so you heard it here listeners <laughs> you you know what's up <laughs> listen to yourself i've also uh heard that um that the pineal gland is is the one that's pretty much mostly associated with uh with this sixth like chakra. I don't I don't have much more to elaborate on that other than that each one supposedly uh also has some other some other uh glands and and such that we can trace them to. But that's yeah. a different podcast. <laughs> no, that, that, you're right. I mean that's one reason why at least in the representation I kind of put the third eye um as a part of the the image. because um if you kind of delve deeper into the head that's where the the pineal gland is so i i really like her nose ring <laughs> <laughs> that's great <laughs> well i i really love these cards and um before we go much further people can find them on the brain mystic website um and also On, so on Etsy, also, also on Etsy. Yeah, uh, if you look up Neuro Tarot on Etsy, you can find the cards, and of course, you can always go to brainmystic dot com. Yeah, perfect. And the, each card has a little interpretation on it, so you don't have to be a neuroscientist or a neuroscience expert. Yeah, you don't understand. have to be a neuroscience expert. In fact, they come with two little booklets, and one booklet is all about the tarot and neuroscience interpretation, and the other booklet is all about the research behind the cards and um how you can use mental imagery and intuition and insight so if you want mm-hmm. to dive a little bit deeper into the science behind it you can use that booklet and it's got a lot of references for scientific articles so you to learn more about how you use new the neuroscience for forecasting and how do you use for prediction and so on so yeah amazing i did not know that about these cards and You can bet I'm about to go grab some. <laughs> I I also um started a YouTube channel recently where each week I just give a little snippet and kind of explain each card. So it's going to go one card a week. So I've done like three so far, so it's going to go for another 20 weeks or so. So yeah. Perfect. All right, well people can check you out there and that's just Neuro Tarot on YouTube. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Is there anything that you'd like to share about the other ways in which neuroscience meets art or spirituality in your work or experience? So it's it's kind of been interesting because um I was raised in the eastern culture but in the western culture where in the scientific world um thinking about connecting some of these dots is not as um is not as open I, I would say. Um, yeah. whereas if you looked at um say um india just sent like a mars rover into into outer space about 2 years ago i think and then before they sent the um the the satellite out they had a they had a a prayer ceremony right where in the scientific uh lab they had in they had an altar and they chanted hymns and they prayed for the good you know uh success of the expedition which yeah. um which are almost been unheard of in uh, a western scientific uh lab um but um i have been um as i mentioned to you before one of my collaborators um in the scientific world is uh jim gimzavsky um who was a nano scientist and he has been working with tibetan monks to um see if chanting you can move atoms with with the power of the brain almost so he's been like looking observing atoms and seeing if you know the monks uh meditation or the prayer can actually cause 
vibrational changes to move stuff. Fascinating. Um, so I think the scientific world is opening up more and more to the concept of um, how neuroscience could be linked with spirituality. And I think there are more studies now on me- the powers of meditation, especially, and mindfulness, is- especially on mm-hmm. how it is relieving um, stress, how it is relieving um, uh, pain, and how it can be used as a, a way for uh, people to uh, overcome PTSD. So um, there are different steps uh, which are being taken now to kind of scientifically address some of the uh, qualities of uh, life improvements that meditation has always claimed to uh, claim to do. Um, so, so that's kind of where. Uh, where I'm at. And then, so for me, when we were thinking about um, predictions and coming into that realm of um, almost woohoo science, right? <laughs> um, what 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 kind of literature is out there is something that I've been really like navigating. And it's been fascinating to me to see that um, neuro forecasting is pretty popular when you think about the stock market. Neuro forecasting is pretty popular when you think about advertising. Like, you know, what is someone going to buy? You know, how do I Mm -hmm. manipulate this that someone is going to buy that? So when you couch it in those terms, people are pretty open about receiving this kind of terms of neuro forecasting and neuro predictions and things like that. And then uh, some of the articles that emerged were crazy where um, they said you you, you could show a picture of, say, the stock market. And then you can ask people uh, while you're recording from their brains, um, what, which stock is, do you think is going to do really well in six months? And then you might say, you know, stock A, but your brain might be actually saying, you know, this other thing is actually going to be doing really well. And then if you aggregate data from like, say, uh, hundreds of people, you can actually predict which stock is actually going to be doing really well like you know six months from now and similarly you can do like what is going to be the most downloaded song six months from now and even though you might think it's going to be song a it actually your brain is predicting or actually the collective conscious is predicting it's going to be song x and so they actually finding out this kind of data on um in like in this field of neuro forecasting wow so that I think the collective conscious has been in some ways, you know, uh, also relegated to the the realms of, oh, this is all kooky. Uh, but mm-hmm. I think with more and more sophisticated imaging techniques and able to um, ask the right questions, I think you will be able to get more information about some of this, uh, some of this stuff. So I'm really excited to see where the field goes from here. Yeah. <laughs> That's really fascinating. Uh, in a previous episode, and I'm not going to ask you to speculate on this because who knows, but in a previous episode, we did talk a little bit about um, you know, the nature of astrology and that maybe part of it does have to do with the collective conscious of a lot of people just, you know, using it for whether it's fun or not, you know, does it affect the way that you wind up looking at the world? That's when so many people are buying into it. And another, yeah. oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to talk about, I guess, um, there is uh, there is some truth to the matter of, you know, uh, setting intentions and that becoming a reality. And so um, when you read something and you interpret it a certain way and you start thinking about, okay, this is how it's going to be, then you manifest it in some, some level. Uh, and that is pretty popularly used in, you know, those kinds of visualization techniques are pretty used in athletics and uh, mm-hmm. sports therapy and, you know, people with in, uh, you know, in therapy for paraplegia or something like that, the whole visualization manifesting to treatment is something that's very popularly used and how that causes these changes in your brain. And so, um, so why not for other things is kind of a question. Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to uh, 
where the research money is coming from and whether it can be used uh, to make a profit or not. If we're looking at advertising and the stock market and <laughs> those kinds of things, or in other cases, you know, studies by the military back in the 60s, 50s, 70s era that were, were shut down about a lot of uh, brain woo woo, as we would say, brain research that yeah, yielded yeah. some very interesting things before being uh, shut down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think we find that when we're, we were talking a little bit about this in, in an herbalism episode where, you know, a lot of things that we s do wind up having solid scientific study on, it's about, you know, well, it's being funded by such and such pharmaceutical brand. And that's why we have so much information on this thing and maybe not on this other thing that's equally as fascinating and, and wonderful. Yeah, the herbal stuff is interesting because a lot of it um, has to do with colonial histories and the native um, knowledge being lost out or being um, looked down upon on some level. Yes. So even I am a product of colonialism and, uh, you know, for a, for a very long time, um, I've you know, speaking good English is like the hallmark of like, you know, being successful or like doing really well. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, I, my mother tongue is Tamil. And even though I know, actually know how to read and, and speak Tamil, it's uh, a lot of the knowledge has been lost. And uh, so it'll be really interesting, I guess, going forward with more people rediscovering some of these things and talking about, you know, anti-colonial uh, teaching and anti-colonial um, knowledge that some of these traditional medicine and traditional herbs and traditional forms of knowing are going to come back into the into the I don't know spectrum I guess yeah that's a, a wonderful reflection I thanks for bringing that up um are there any big myths that you'd like to debunk or any other important messages that you'd like to share in regards to your work? Cause we get a lot of like weird fake science floating around out there. And I just want to make sure that, you know, we, we do our, our best every time in every episode to make sure that we're not putting more <laughs> out there in the world. <laughs> no, that's really important. Um, I think, um, the one main, the biggest myth, I guess, is the whole left brain, right brain thing that people talk about. Oh, I'm left brain. I'm like an artist or I was the other way around. I don't know what it is. But, <laughs> um, we use pretty much both sides of the brains constantly. Maybe the speech centers are on one side as opposed to the other. And uh, but most of us use both sides of the brains uh, pretty constantly. And that uh, I would say that the left brain, right brain, um, asymmetry between personalities is something of a myth. Um, and maybe that will give people some hope as to, oh, I suck at art. But no, maybe not. Maybe you do. Maybe you have some, like, you know, design tendencies or something and you just haven't developed it because you've been told you don't, you're not good at it. Um, so, yeah, that's something to think about, I would say. Bringing it back to art and science. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when I was in my theater undergrad, we used to do this thing called uh, a right brain walk. And we would walk around the whole campus for a whole hour and we weren't allowed to say any words. We like shut down the speech center or whatever to try and get ourselves to stop thinking words. Um, and we were only allowed to, to say e or o or, or ooh or the things like that. And is, is there anything... I mean, so now we know that that wasn't a right brain walk, but it was just, you know, get trying to get out of the speech centers. Um, is there anything to that or not? I don't know. I actually have never heard of it. Um, it is true that the speech centers are located um, on one side of the brain as opposed to the other for for most people, but not for everybody. Um, Whoa. So, um, <laughs> and then more and more now they are coming up with, the brain is not a black box that um, not everybody uses the same parts of the brain for exactly the same things. Um, so, of course, on a gross level, you know, 
you use the fr- the frontal lobe for like consciousness kind of stuff and then the back of the head for your visual centers but um there's a lot of differences in how people use the brain based on your socio cultural upbringing so for example if i ask you to add add numbers they found that a lot of um people trained in the western um uh in the western system use the verbal centers of their brain um for for adding because you think of 1 plus 1 is 2 kind of thing and you learn tables whereas mm-hmm. people who grow up in japan use the motor parts of their brain because they use the abacus for uh mathematics so um a completely different part of the brain is being used for this thing of math um wow. similarly um um and other kinds of social cultural differences are coming up for example how if um i tell if i show you a picture and i ask you very quickly write down like the five things you observe about this they found that there are big differences between how people say in the us what what people would notice as opposed to what people in say um Korea or Japan would notice and the people in the US would maybe write down if if say if I say show you a picture of an aquarium you'll say i saw five fish um and you know i saw a frog whereas the people from Japan might say oh the the pond is like green in color and the pebbles are like all so they look at more of the background as opposed to the foreground and mm-hmm. so if you actually change the background their entire observation changes um so i think it's very simplistic to think about left and right whereas supposed to individual differences because of how you're brought up and you know all the different things that have gone into shaping that brain i think that's a really great way to bring it back to tarot because <laughs> i mean if we look at these cards there's so many different parts of them and in the traditional decks you know you're looking at the suit you're looking at the elements you're looking at the numerology the pictures the story how many swords are there what are the swords doing who's holding them what are they being used for and but there's also you know there's a pond back there well if there's water in the card then it means this and there's this part is yellow so you know it reminds me you visually of this other card that it's tied to and stuff i did just can't be underestimated the the amount of uh thought symbolism the amount of background that you can draw upon for each particular image all those things seem really important yeah i think it's true and i think the 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 secret behind it i would say is um try to make as vivid an image as you can so that then your brain is just going to pick up all these elements and make a narrative out of it and um it's not that you're spoon feeding the narrative to the person but you are um giving them the these cues almost and then the brain is then going to put it all together and uh um, you're also giving some verbal cues or like almost verbal metaphors by saying you know this card is associated with this um and then that is also going to add a certain richness or layer um to the story that your brain is making up and and then you add the next element of you know the two people looking at it where you have a questioner and the reader and so are you listening to this person's body language are you like you know what is the tone of their voice you know are they looking worried you know so those kinds of elements also come in and then the last thing would be even when the the reader is telling you know this is what i think about what is when i'm looking at these cards how that is processed by the questioner is going to be completely different so ultimately they are taking in those words and they are forming their own set of images in their head as to okay this is what i heard even though that might not be exactly what the person said you know the what you hear is going to be a little different so right. th- there are all these layers of <laughs> brain processing going on here <laughs> i think it's a rich area for research <laughs> Absolutely. There's it's like a especially when you're co-reading or reading for somebody, you're co-creating a whole new mental experience that you've shared parts of but never the whole of. And I think that is the thing about having somebody else read for you is of course they're not going to be inside your brain, but if you 
listen to them, they might come up with something that triggers something else inside your brain. And it's, it's a, it's, um, what is the motion I'm doing here? It's, it's more than a cycle. It's like a, a cell. Uh, like I'm imagining, never mind. It doesn't matter what I'm imagining. <laughs> <laughs> probably like air currents or, or something like that <laughs> but yeah it's re- it's reciprocal yeah yeah any parting words or other nuggets of wisdom to share mm, snails are cool <laughs> <laughs> snails are really cool we're pro uh, snails i'm pro snails <laughs> uh, <laughs> and no, I think uh, I think it'll be nice if more people are um, open-minded. More scientists are also open-minded about some of these things, and um, and then there'll be more synergy between the arts and the sciences. Um, and there's been a movement now where you know artists are becoming um, welcomed into science labs, and uh, there are artists in residences and labs around the world. And it'll how be do also- I land one of those jobs? <laughs> Um, you should look up. Um, I think even the Allen Brain Institute has an artist in residence program, and I think UW Medicine has a. Uh, there's a person called uh, William Di Paolo, um, and he has an artist in residence program in his lab at UW. Um, wow! And then you can email me. I'll send you a few. Um, there's one in <laughs> Australia called Symbiotica, which is amazing. Um, they've grown like you know lab grown meat and they have artists involved in this and uh, they've done all kinds of amazing art artists in residences and science labs Um, so I think because a lot of times science work is done in the set of the university and the way they communicate is through journals and the language is so weird on some level (laughs) that I think that you know exposing scientists to artists is going to help them learn how to communicate better and also have fun i think you know my collaboration with artists has made me a better scientist because i'm much more open to exploring new ways of um, looking at my experiments or just trying things out Um, because especially a lot of artists i think are not as afraid to you know put it out there and then see what the audience response is. And then they go back and tinker with it and then they put it out there again. And then that, that the iteration process is a little bit more public. And mm-hmm. whereas the scientific process is much more isolated and then only the final product is revealed, um, if at all. Um, so I think it'll be nice to see more of those public um, displays so that people, the audience can re- or the public can react to it. And then we can go back and tinker with it. So I think that, that might be a really cool way to, you know, thrust forward the science as well. So. Yeah, I'm thinking in particular a lot about like the, the the field of theoretical physics and how so many of the theories being posited. You know, you see five new ones on space.com every week of like maybe these are actually this, and maybe time is like this, and and all that kind of stuff. So many of them come out of of left field, you're like, how did anybody think of that? That can't be right scientifically. And then, you know, somebody finds a way of testing part of it and they say either, well, yeah, that didn't work <laughs> or, or, huh, something here might not be, you know, mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. that weird or that far off. And so I think that, uh, that co-collaboration of the really wild thinkers and the people who are able to say, okay, how do we test this? <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's a good one, it's a fruitful really one. Good because people are moving towards this now, especially even in astronomy, with the whole crowdsourcing of you know, look up in the sky and you know, tell yeah. us what's going on. And I think we are becoming more open to it, and it's really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, where should a person go if they want to learn more about? some of the things that we've discussed today. I mean, we've talked a little bit about where to find your work um, and I'll definitely be putting that in our show notes. But if people are just interested in neuroscience in general or any of these topics, what would you suggest? What's top of your beginner's bookshelf? 
So um, there have been a few places where I, I've been um, using as references for, say, some of my beginner classes, as well as some of these uh, Neuro Tarot books. Um, and I would say um, the Scientific American and the New Scientist are both good places for popular science articles um, for you to kind of delve into some of these uh, questions. Um, the BBC actually has some really cool um, uh, beginner level stuff for uh, learning more about uh, the brain and the power of intuition and things like that. Um, the If you want to go a little bit deeper, but still not get completely bogged down by scientific jargon, um, <laughs> <laughs> frontiers in neuroscience or frontiers in uh, cognitive science or neuropsychology, some articles there are actually really accessible and uh, easy to understand. And they are peer-reviewed journals, so it's kind of a step up from the popular science uh, where you're actually feeling like you're reading something that was raw, almost like raw data or raw, uh -huh. um, more like fresh out of the press kind of things. Um, and they, I feel like the language in some of those papers are much more accessible um, as opposed to, say, a journal like Nature or something like that. So, Right, yeah. Well, thanks for those recommendations. I know that a lot of people, you know, know that there's a, a disconnect between the journal paper and usually the pop science article and that there's a lot of interpretation that one can do before one gets to the other. Um, but of course, if you aren't familiar with reading journals all the time, it's really easy to lose the thread completely. Um, with the, the and large one point language. about that is a lot of these, if you find that a lot of journals are behind paywalls, um, oh, yeah. one, one way to uh, get around this would be um, once libraries open, most public <laughs> universities, the libraries are supposed to give you access because it's a public university is using public money. So if you go to a public university library and you search for things, you, you should be able to get access. So. Fantastic. I know that um, I think JSTOR as well has some pandemic deals. <laughs> so, and I've also heard that sometimes uh, if you want to read a paper and you can't find it, you should just contact the person who wrote it. Yes. Um, there's a website called ResearchGate. And if you go there, um, you can just contact authors directly and they'll just let you know. Uh, usually they're all very, actually, the the scientists are very open about giving their um, uh, re papers out. The journals are the ones which are much more anal about it. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, um, let's go ahead and reiterate where we can find your work before we end our call here. Yeah. So I have my website, which is www.brainmystic. That's B-R-A-I-N-M-Y-S-T-I-C, brainmystic.com. Um, I'm going to be soon offering courses on new age neuroscience, uh, especially for diviners who are astrologers, tarot readers, or oracle card readers. But of course, if you're just a brain enthusiast, you're welcome to join the course. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about mental imagery and uh, visual and verbal metaphors and the circuits behind intuition and insight and neuro forecasting. Um, and if you want to buy the Neuro Tarot cards, you can buy them on Etsy. You can look up Neuro Tarot or just go to my website, brainmystic.com. And finally, I've started a YouTube channel um, on Neuro Tarot, where each week for the next 20 weeks or so, I'm going to be posting a video about each of these cards and the neuroscience concept behind them. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for chatting with us today, Siddharth. This was amazing. I learned so many things. Thank you. That just about wraps it up for this month. But be sure to tune in next month for our final episode in the first season, all about eclipses. And because our episode schedule is based around new moons, our final episode will actually take place on the date of the next solar eclipse. Very exciting. This also means that between now and our next episode, you might just have the opportunity to glimpse a lunar eclipse on the full moon, May 26th. It will be best for folks in Australia and the South Pacific, 
but folks in East Asia and North and South America should be able to see at least a good bit of it. I'll post a link in the episode description so you can find out a bit more about when and where to watch for the eclipse, as well as how much of the eclipse you should be able to see. And since next month is the final episode in the first season, that also means that I'm beginning to plan the next one. So if you have any queries about the cosmos, suggestions for guests, corrections or disagreements, sponsor interest, fan mail, or special requests for other intersections of science, spirituality, storytelling, and the human experience, drop me a line at cosmologieschannel at gmail.com. And in the meantime, I should probably remind you to like, review, share, and subscribe if you like this stuff, because it really, really makes a difference. Cosmologies is written and produced by yours truly, Natalie Copeland, and our theme music is written and performed by Aaron J. Shea. Special thanks to this month's amazing guest, Dr. Siddharth Ramakrishnan, and as always, dear listener, stay wonderful. From the mysteries within us to the majesty without, cosmology, that's what it's like.